Hello and um, welcome to Fire in the Belly. Today we're having the same myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by the Annette Houston. Hello, hello. Hello, Pete. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Welcome to the show. Look, been looking you forward so to this one. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to it too. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. So um, to give people a bit of a background, I've known Annette now for a year, year and a half, maybe two, two years. Two, yeah, coming up yeah. on two, it was January, wasn't it? It 20... was January. 2020 ish okay. <laughs> it, it, it all gets a bit vague after a while you yeah. know times and, and pandemics so many years, and what, you know? so, many years. <laughs> so um and that's fabulous there's so many things that does so i'm absolutely delighted to have you on the show so for the sake of our listeners and that tell us who are you what do you do and where are you from okay my name is annette houston um i am from donegal so i've been born and reared here and lived here all my life um I am a mum. I am a huge Disney fan. Anything related to Disney or Florida. If, if I'm going to go anywhere, that's where I'm. If I'm not done in Gaul, I'm going to be over there. And I also am a business owner. So I own a few businesses and I've had a few other businesses during the years. Um, the ones that I own currently are all cleaning related. So I am the CEO of FM Services Group. And that is a group of cleaning related companies. FM Services does uh, industrial, commercial, um, government type contracts. So it's all it's all um, commercial type cleaning work. Uh, Cleaners in a Click is a marketplace where we match residential cleaning service providers with end users. And Bright Academy is a cleaning training portal platform. Wow. You're a busy woman. Just a bit. Yeah. Is Just that the way you like it? You like to be busy? Yes, love being busy. I love, I've kind of, I love the challenge of innovation and I love the creativity side of being in business. I'm not so good at the, like the day-to-day -day side of stuff. They're, you're better off not asking me to do things that require day-to-day -day diligence. I'm probably not that person. My teachers back in school would have told you that, um, you know, from very early on, that pattern was probably there. <laughs> not sure where that comes from but um yeah i like i like trying to see how we can make things better how we can improve things can we you know see gaps in the market that we can fill um all of those kind of things so yeah i'll chat about it i suppose as we go on today but there was other businesses down i'm turning off this heat here we minute that's roasting um so there's probably other businesses down through the years that i was um, involved in or I, I started that aren't still here but um, they filled a need at the time um, and they were I was very passionate about them at the time <laughs> but once they got to that stage where they required day-to-day -day care and attention that's probably where my interest went out the window basically. That's, that's really interesting to know that about yourself so when it's get down to creativity strategy forward planning you're the, the right person when it comes Love to day-to-day -day sort of normal regular stuff get you out of there because you're likely to wreck the place yeah yeah I can be I can be very like I'm I can be very resilient and I can do that stuff it's just maybe not what I'm passionate about doing it's not what I love doing um if needs must I'll do it um but I wouldn't be the best at it and it's taken me a long time over the years to recognize that that's not my strength and there are better people than me in those seats in our business now. Um, years ago, I was trying to sit in all the seats and some of the seats I was really bad at. <laughs> so it was like making life difficult for me, the business and everybody involved in the business. Um, so once you kind of figure out where your strengths are, I try and sit there if I can. Um, and I try and maybe put people in the right seats of the bus. Do, do, you, you know. do you see it i mean do you see when you know when you're talking strategy for a business or who goes where can you almost see it in your head of what it's going to play out like yeah even before even maybe before somebody's hired like sometimes i'll see right i'm bottlenecking like the bot the business isn't growing because of something that i'm doing and it took like i say it took a long time for me to be able to be reflective or self-reflective enough to know right this is me this is my stuff that's stopping this um but once you 
can start to see that stuff immediately you can start to see solutions once you realize right if i get out of my own way here and stop this bottleneck from happening what what am i missing that's needed for this to be successful so once you can figure out the type of person or the type of role that it is and there's um there's a, there's lots of different ways of doing this the one that i studied in and learned in was a, a system called ima um and it was a it's about the different colors you know so people are either red green blue or yellow mm-hmm. and there's different strengths and different um, attributes to each color and likewise jobs are colors so anything organized and systemized and repetitive or requires you know consistent action over a long period of time is probably a very green color green role whereas i'm red you know high red red by yellow huh would you be a high red by chance i might be yes (laughs) it's a bit of yellow in there too but i am a like so to to understand like when i when i first learned about that a lot of things started to make sense i was kind of going ah that's why i can't do that job Or that's why I find that so difficult. Whereas there's other people, like there's people in the business who are fantastic greens and blues, but they couldn't do the red jobs. They they couldn't, you know, go in and be a salesperson or talk to clients or, you know, and people tend to work in different ways. So I then understood, well, that's why I'm not the best person to put into that job because I'm not green, you know? So there's no, there's no judgment around it. It's just understanding that there's different, there's different seats for people within the, the business um, and that you can't sit on all of them. You know, you're not all the colors. You couldn't possibly be. Do you think, do you think that's been a, a big step for you is to actually, instead of learning what you can do, is learning what you can't do and being prepared to get out of there or to fill that position by somebody else? Is that- yes. I think um, probably up until... I went back to college in 2012. I was very much of the opinion that I knew everything that needed to be known. And I caused us in our business and me personally, so much trouble, so much trouble by not understanding that I didn't know it all and not understanding that there were other people that were able to do things more efficiently. They were able to do things way better than I could do them more accurately whatever you know whatever kind of role that it was it wasn't my strength um and understanding that you know not not every business probably has that capacity to be able to put people in all the seats sometimes when especially in the early days of a business and when your business is growing you've no choice but to put yourself in all of the seats because it is you you are the driver and you are the operations person and the HR manager and the staff and everything so you kind of have to be everything at the beginning but I suppose once you recognize that in order for your business to continue growing you need to get out of your own way a bit Um, and for me that point came about a year into my master's the penny finally dropped and it was like, right, OK, we're going to have to try some of this wonderful theory that we're learning um, and see. And it, it did. It was a game changing for my business, like and for for the businesses. Um, definitely. Big, huge step. Tell me, I mean, well, what, what does fire in the belly mean to you then? You see. I suppose from a from a personal perspective, Mm. For me, it's what motivates me, what drives me. And for me personally, that looks very different to what the business's fire in the belly is. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, my driving force is probably defined in my profile picture on any of my social channels. It's my family and like experiences with my family. And if you know me well enough, and you know I've said this already, I'm a huge Disney fan. So if you get me and my family to Disney, I'm a happy girl. That's all I care about. <laughs> Just creating experiences with the people that I love, you know. Um, and that that probably comes, I suppose, from 
the experience that, experiences that I had as a child or the lack of experiences that I has, had as a child because of the things that we went through. Um, so I kind of want to naturally want to provide a different outcome for, for my family. Um, but for a business, the fire in a business's belly is very different, you know, um, and I think that's probably a key to success in, in certain ways or in that if you can find that, if you can understand what drives your business, if you can understand what it is that you actually provide your clients with, you know, we, we think that we sell cleaning services. We think that that's what the thing is, but that's not what the thing is. It's never what you think it is. You know, it's like for us, some of the feedback over the years that we would have got from clients is like, we're their go-to problem solver. When the shit hits the fan from a facilities perspective, excuse the French, that it's knowing, it's their knowing that we will solve their problem. That's what they, that's what they're paying for. It's not the, the fact that we provide, you know, whatever kind of grade of cleaning service or we have staff trained to a certain level or, you know, that's all, that's the, the how you're, you know, I suppose that's the bit that everybody else could do. But they know when they lift the phone to me or to our operations managers, they will get their problem solved. They don't have to ask how we do it. They don't have to figure all that stuff out. They don't have to work with us on it. We just say, yeah, that's fine. And we'll deal with it from there on. And that's what makes us valuable to our clients. But we have to build that culture within our entire organization so that everybody in our organization answers our clients the same way, you know, and that it's from the new person in the door last week to the person that's been there 25 years, that the culture in our business is that our clients get told, we have no idea how we're going to fix this, but we'll fix it. We'll figure it out, you know? Um, and that's what's valuable not necessarily what we do it's the response that they get when they ring with a problem is that is it culture is it tenacity is it pure stubbornness what is it if you were to try and put it into a pot <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's kind of yeah it probably it, it's definitely it is the culture within our business you know, but you're right. It probably has been derived from years of being, of having to be very resilient and having to, like, if things were going phenomenally well back in 2009 and 2010, which it wasn't, but say it was, and a customer rang and they looked, they were having this huge problem and I had business coming out my ears, I probably would have went, do you know what? That's too much hassle. I don't need your business. I don't need that problem on top of all the other work I'm doing. So thanks very much. But no, we're, we're okay for work. But we weren't in that position for many, many years. Even in the very early stages of our business, we got a, we're, there was financial challenges right at the outset of our, our business. Um, so we kind of learned this um, tenacious mindset very early on that we have to fight to keep our clients we have to solve their problems to be valuable because there was 30 other contract service providers out there fighting for the same business we were for 50p an hour less or 80p an hour less so you had no choice but to do something different to try and make sure that you didn't lose the business because there was little enough of it there at the time um so i suppose over the years there probably has been a, a massive amount of um stubbornness Definitely. Um, and I would be a Taurus as well. So that probably doesn't help matters, but I'm a very, very stubborn, resilient. I like to call it resilience, but I am very stubborn. Mm -hmm. You know I mean, this about me anyway, Pete. <laughs> just, I'm just maybe letting other few other people know this, you know, so... <laughs> Well, tell me, I mean, are you are you driven by then the pain or the pleasure? I mean, is the pain or preventing the pain from happening again? Possibly that, it... possibly that, yeah. Um, I suppose to give you a background, 
um, as to where that may stem from in me. And it's something that I've worked very hard to understand, you know, and I've, I've tried to unpack it enough that I can learn from it and use it to my strength rather than to let it define and dictate how I respond to things. Um, but when I was very young, so I would have been around six, seven years old, um, my dad's family had a business nothing related to this business, but they had another family business when I was a child and the business went, um, basically it went bad, you know, so there was fallout between the families and there was two sides of my family involved in this. So there was my dad's family, which it was their business. So my dad, his brother and my granddad, and you know, there was a, there was a lot of family on that side of the house. And then on top of that, there was a brother on my mom's side as well. So when this all went to shit, excuse the French again, like all sides of my family unit that I knew just disintegrated. And then we lost our family home. So within the space of maybe two years, my dad had a brain hemorrhage and he was, he had paralysis on one side. Um, so he, his ability to work was taken away from him. Um, then we had the breakdown of the business and then we lost our family home. And I remember as a kid, like, I, I remember the day we got evicted from our home and we ended up in council accommodation. Thank God we had a neighbor who decided he was going down on a Friday evening to sit in the council offices at like half three. And they just for record, they close about half four and it's like they lock up and it's Monday morning again. So he went down and he said, I'm not leaving until you give me the keys of a house for this family. And like there was a lorry sitting in our street with all of our furniture and our clothes and toys and stuff. And I remember playing with his kids outside on my roller skates and like I knew it was happening, but I didn't realize the significance of what was happening because I was I can't remember what age I was then, probably around 10, nine or 10 around that age. And he went down and he was like, um, I'm not leaving until you give them a key for a house. And I think he they realized how serious he was and they were like, shit, we're not going to get home this weekend. Can somebody sort this guy out? So eventually they did give him a key for a house and we lived in that house for 12 years after that. But he, that period of time that we lived there, I like I watched the, our families just disintegrate and there was all this bad feeling all the time. And, you know, when there was a family wedding, there was like, there was this table and then these cousins couldn't sit there because they weren't speaking to us. And oh, it was just, it was horrible. <laughs> like, so there's a, there's a reason, I suppose, that family and the experiences that our family, my family experience, um, I want them to be so different. And then the other side of it is, I suppose, like the the understanding of how that impacted me, me and my brother um, both went through the same thing. And we both looked for security after that happened. So, but in very different ways. And this is something that I, I, we often talk about and we were like, you know, how did we both go through the same thing and have totally different um, responses to it? Even mm -hmm. though we were looking for the same thing, we had completely different responses. So my brother joined the army and then he went into a career in academia and he wanted to be in the safe, secure, long term job so he could have security. And the last thing he would ever con contemplate doing would be set up his own business and have all of that going on. Whereas I looked at it completely differently. So I thought the only way that I can have security is by being in complete control of my own business. You know, we both had our houses when we were 18, 19. We both, you know, work really hard to make sure that we're stable and secure and all of that. But it's it's funny, you know, that two people who went through the exact same thing at the exact same time <laughs> went down two completely different paths. Um, but so, yeah, I suppose. The why, why do you think that is? Why do people react differently? You know, some thrive and... and set off on a whole different path and some people keep their head as low as possible i don't know i suppose like for him he's seen it as maybe 
this was the more secure option. He thought he was going down the more the more secure path, hmm. whereas possibly that's just um, he was a little bit older than me, and maybe he's seen things that I didn't see. I seen like I seen the errors within. Now I was I was quite young, but I I think early on I could see this was a this was a people falling out with people issue this wasn't a business issue right the people they let the people and their emotions get in the way of the business and that's what created the problems within the business um i don't know i don't know why one chose one way and one chose the other all i know is i i thought that i was making the decision to have the most security i wanted to make sure that no one could ever take this away from me. And then times after that, when the business got in trouble, so 1997, 98, and then again in 90 or 2009, 10, after the recession, there were two very, very challenging financial times, and especially the second one. That dragged on for three or four years, and it was horrific. But And there was many, many times during that that I wanted to close the door. And I wanted to say, I've had enough, cannot take any more of the stress and trauma and relentless negative stuff every day. But there was there, there was a thranness and a stubbornness there that said there is no way that there's another house going to be lost over the head of a business. It's not happening. And at that stage, my mom and dad were still in the business and their house was tied to the business. So I didn't want with me at the helm being responsible for my mom and dad's house being lost again you know there was just no way that that was going to happen plus at that stage too we had a 120 staff so they all had livelihoods and mortgages and all of that so there was a huge weight of responsibility thinking if i just give up and walk away how many of these people are going to lose their home because I I wouldn't fight for something I'm asking them to fight for and come into work every day. Do you know? So there's probably a you're you're probably right. There's a massive part of it, especially in in the earlier years, that was a, a drive to avoid pain. So the I think definitely in the in the earlier years of the business, that's what it came from. Now. I think it's it's slightly different, probably because circumstances are different, um, but also because of the learnings maybe that I've had down through the years and understanding that by motivating people in a different way that you can get a better outcome. Um, so there's, yeah. Looking back at that, what did you learn? From the challenging times. Mm. Um. Mm. there's probably there's probably a lot of a lot of lessons there the first one is that I was really crap at asking for help like I mean woefully bad at asking for help and I didn't ask for help quite a lot of the time and I made things really difficult for myself because I wouldn't ask for help and that's something that I have learned to do I'm still not I'm not the best person in the world at it. I'm not the, I wouldn't put my hand up first and ask for help, but that's the stubbornness in me too, you see. Um, but I am better. I'm more aware of it. And I'm, if I'm struggling with something for any length of time, I stop and I go, right, are you being stubborn here and not asking for help or do you need to ask for help? <laughs> and I am better at it. Um, the other thing I suppose is that we don't, we don't necessarily see things as they are. Um, that's something that I think definitely, I again, when I go back to the, the early days, you know, you, you can, I was really naive. Do you know, I used to, somebody would tell me something and I would just take it as gospel that it was true and it might fall out with the person on the other side of the equation over the head of it. And it was like totally not their fault. And, you know, trying to trying to stay objective and look at the problem in its entirety. So when somebody comes to you with a problem and they're bringing you their, if you've ever read that book, The Monkey Mind or whatever, the 
Chimp Paradox, isn't that the one? Mm -hmm. Where they bring you. Yeah. Um, So when people come to you with the problem, you know, set the problem down for a wee minute and go and assess the entire situation before you act and before you do something about it. Make sure that you're fully aware of what that person's motivation might be. Um, what are the what's the other side of that story, or what's the other side of the the issue that they're bringing? Because there's always another side. There's always more perspectives to it than just that one. Um, and like that, when you're trying to solve a problem in your business, or you're looking for, you know, you're looking forward at your next strategy. Um, it's not not a good idea to just rely on your own viewpoint all the time, because quite often we don't see it as other people in our business see it. Um, whether that's you know taking your team and asking their viewpoint on it, or asking for their input on stuff, um, or or vice versa, looking at your looking to speak to your clients and see how are they going to respond to this change. Um, so yeah, just getting a well-rounded view of stuff as well would have been lessons that I have learned, Pete. <laughs> it's interesting. I always it? didn't always do that, but but you are, I mean, you, when you're, you know, you, you have this, as you say, this huge responsibility and all the connections and all the, the add-ons to that. So in some ways it's like, I have to keep going. But it's then also, it is difficult to take on board opinions, thoughts, ideas from those around you as well, because you're kind of going, hold on, I still need to drive forward. And, you know, you maybe don't get a full grasp of what's going on here. And so it's, it is hard, right? You know, it's not, a, I, don't, I don't know if it's a failing per se. It's, it's maybe getting the right perspective or the right connection. And I, th- I think that's where I would have been lacking. I would have taken on no perspectives. Hmm. It would have been my perspective my way forward and i didn't take into account how that was going to impact other people it's that saying where you're free to choose but you're not free from the consequences of your choice that comes up for me all the time and it's like i i watch people and businesses around me or i watch you know friends or family and they make decisions and they don't necessarily look forward at how is this going to impact other people how is this going to impact my family how is this going to impact my colleagues and then they're surprised when there's fallout from this stuff and it's it's kind of where I was years ago Mm. where I was kind of making decisions and taking actions and not taking into account other people that are going to be impacted by the decisions that I make and it's those people you don't have to get the opinion of the entire um, cohort in your organization on something but if your decisions are going to directly impact a cohort of clients or a particular team within your business then it's your job to make sure that you check in with them before you do anything that's going to upset the apple cart because you can it's very hard to build a team morale and team resilience and team cohesiveness and to get to that stage where you have a high performing team it's so easy to knock it all off and that can be one bad judgment call from you that can destroy a team you know, or any manager or leader within an organization. And quite often that's the problem within teams that are not performing. It's because somebody has gone in and done something that has upset the whole apple cart and they haven't taken their opinion on board. That's, you know, if you talk to any team that are not performing or, you know, any organization staff that are unhappy, you'll probably find a lot of it boils down to the fact that they don't feel like they're valued. They don't feel like their opinion counts for anything. And simply nine times out of 10 is because they're not asked, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not rocket science, but when we, like I went from doing none of that to being at a stage during the master's program where I kind of got very indecisive for a while because the penny dropped about a year in going, God, I actually don't know anything. (laughs) And then you're trying to weigh up all of this. You're getting all this new knowledge because you're learning so much and you're trying to make a decision and you're aware that your old decision-making equipment's not the best and you've all this new decision-making equipment here to work with, but how do you choose which lens to put it through? How do you know which of these new um, theories that you have is going to be the right one to use 
because before you would have just made the decision based on your gut or your past experience but you now realize that that's maybe not the best outcome you're going to get so you have to try and suppose it's no different to learning to drive a car you know so when you start to learn to drive a car first it feels really clunky and it feels really um awkward and you're trying to you know change the gears and look in the mirror and do all these things and it doesn't come naturally at the beginning it takes practice and it takes a while of going over and through this same process over and over again for it to feel comfortable and for you to become completely competent and unconsciously competent at it Um, and it's the same when you're learning these skills as well that it takes a while for you to feel confident and competent I always get them mixed up um so yeah that I mean it is fascinating you know down to you know the, the gutter past experience and and I'm just curious I mean is it because of your experience that sort of 10 year old rollerblading or roller skating around the park with the removal lorry and your life and the house is gone and all that is it that experience that's dragged it forward in a positive negative it just it, it's just experience right is that what gives it depth of this has to happen this is you know you understand forward consequences as opposed to you know and that sort of almost builds up in the gut do you think maybe maybe like my 10 year old self didn't know how significant that that day was hmm. you know i had no clue when i was that age even for for probably eight or nine years after that, I didn't fully grasp just how significant that was. But there was lots of things that led up to that. So like, for example, my my dad prior to his illness, my dad during and after his illness, my mom's response to dad's illness, the rest of the family's responses to how things played out. Like, I, I don't like recall in detail a lot of that stuff, but I do recall substantial and significant events over that period of time. And as an adult in my own business, and particularly since I had my own daughter, my own family, I'm thinking, geez, that, that was really wrong, like what happened. And I maybe didn't perceive it that way when I was 10 or when I was seven, but as an adult looking back, maybe the jigsaw pieces started to all fit together. And as a business owner, looking back at what happened, I was like, you could name out the days that the stuff went, started to go wrong and the relationships broke down bit by bit, decision by decision, fallout by fallout, you know, and if, and I think not, not to be too critical of the circumstances that happened because people did the best they could with the information they had at the time, but in hindsight looking back it could have all been avoided with proper communication and somebody being a leader everything could have been avoided all that family breakup mess and again that's something that I'm very adamant about that I don't want something like that to happen in in any business I'm involved in you know and that probably does come from maybe not necessarily the emotions that I felt on that day that I was riding around in my roller skates, but I watched even in the years after that, definitely in the years before it, and certainly in the years after it, I watched the impact that it had on my parents. And I watched the impact that it had on other adults in our family. And the fact, you know, that we must, events of people that were important in our life because these um adults weren't behaving like adults do you know um and it's when i look back at that sort of um period of time i kind of i feel a sense of loss that things didn't pan out the way that they could have panned out I don't in any way feel responsible or anything like that I just simply I know in my gut I do not want that to happen to any business I'm involved in I want to be able to be 
cognizant of the issues that happened before and ensure that I, it's too late for that circumstance, but it's not too late for me to learn those lessons and apply those lessons in my businesses going forward and make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, so when things were tough, um, there probably was a hellfire, no, <laughs> kind of way with me that that, that was never going to happen again, you know. It's, it's good to, it's good to have that clarity. I mean, you know, I'm just curious, I mean, do, your father's illness, was it connected, do you think, to the, the business and what happened? Or, you know, was that just something that was going to happen anyway, do you think? I think that was probably going to happen anyway. Dad had a, a brain hemorrhage. Um, so it's, I, I don't really know what the causes of that are, but I know his lifestyle leading up to that, um, you know, the 80 and the 100 hour weeks and the typical of, uh, you know, typical of married life in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, man goes out to work, woman stays at home looks after the kids, does the, does the household chores and stuff. And then man comes home from work, eats dinner and goes to pub and stays in pub most of the evening and comes home. And that happens m most days of the week, yeah. most days of the week. Um, so, and again, it's like, thankfully dad had, had actually, um, he'd stopped socializing and drinking a few years, maybe about two years prior to his brain hemorrhage because his, doctors and his clinicians said that he wouldn't have survived otherwise so we were very grateful that that was the case um but i suppose like him being ill and him being in a position where he couldn't work because dad was always a very um very hard worker mightn't have always seen the wisest way to do things but he would have driven on and got it done regardless he wouldn't have maybe stood back and said, right, what, what's the most efficient way of doing this? He would have just worked till it was done. You know, he was one of them kind of grafters. Sounds um, familiar. And, mm, possibly. I'm trying to learn that lesson. I'm trying to step back and go, is this the best way to achieve this goal? Mm. Um, but yeah, he, he possibly because of the illness he had after in his paralysis and it took quite a while for him to be able to be physically able to go to work again it was I think it was close on a year year and a half before he was able to walk and talk and he had to learn to you know eat and like everything on his right side was completely stopped working like one side of his face didn't just didn't work and the other side did and it was really frustrating for him because his brain remembered how he used to be able to do things and his body wouldn't follow instructions. So he used to get really, he used to get really frustrated at himself because he would try and do something and maybe his hand wouldn't work or his foot wouldn't work. And he would be like, you know, um, and then the other side of that coin too, I suppose, is prior to dad's illness, he would have been very, um, very strict. Do you know, not not um, in a physical way or anything like that, but he was very strict, like don't be making noise and all of this kind of crack. And he would have give out like that if he had done something in the house. But after he got sick, he couldn't give out. And it was like something in his brain, obviously, whatever part of the brain, it was the left side of his brain was damaged. But that must be the side that his giving out muscles were on. Because no matter what we did, he used to just laugh at us. And me and my brother thought this was the best thing ever happened to him. Because no matter what we did, I remember my brother and me were playing hairdressers one day. And I, my hair was like long, straight hair down to my back, like way down my back. And cut all my hair off in big circles and triangles and stuff. It was, oh, it was desperate. <laughs> and um, he came in and literally my mommy cried for like a week. My mommy was in tears crying. And my dad just came in and he just laughed. He was like, I know I should be mad, but he said, he can't get mad. And he he just lost the, the ability to be cross after, which was great for us. Um, maybe not so good for mum. She had to be bad cop then too. <laughs> There's a lot of mischief in those eyes. You can just tell you were there is. Yeah. up to a whole lot. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. 
what did you want to do when you know mini mini Annette what was she going to do when she grew up uh this is funny actually I there was two things that I wanted to do I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast I was very I was a gymnast um I wasn't a brilliant gymnast don't get me wrong I uh but I did I love gymnastics and I I was very inspired by Nadia Kamenichi so I that's what I wanted to be I wanted to be her you know for years and years and then I had a really bad burn actually before we lost our home it was about what age was I I can't really remember now I think it was about eight or nine I mom came home from work one night and I made a uh like a pot of tea for her and I made a cup of coffee for dad and I like the tray and I put it down on the hearth in the sitting room and I didn't push it over far enough. So it tipped back over and it scalded me in the legs and stuff. So that was like Christmas Eve, I think. And I ended up in a &E for most of Christmas Day and Boxing Day and all that, trying to get like they were, am I going to, we're going to need skin grafts and all this. Now it turned out that I didn't, but it affected my gymnastics training quite a lot because I wasn't able to move my joint for about six months. I had this bandage these bandages on and I had to keep going back to A&E and getting them changed and stuff um that's back in the days when you could walk into a &E and get seen um unlike now where you need mm. a four-year appointment but anyway um so yeah that that was kind of the that was the the thing I wanted to be when I was younger and then when I was a bit older actually I wanted to be an air traffic controller I wanted to like what's that term push 10 <laughs> Washington um I wanted to be an air traffic controller so I did neither of those things obviously um I went on to I studied electronic engineering when I was at college I went to college and studied electronic engineering which I kind of thought eventually might get me down the path of air traffic control because I was kind of looking at what what do you need to learn what so, like what skill sets do you need um but anyway where did, I, that, where did that come from, the air traffic control? No idea. It, I it, do not know. It's just it's something I, I wanted to do. I thought that would be a really cool job, to sit up on the tower and watch planes going all over the world like, and help plane. I don't know why. And I didn't realize it was probably, apparently it's one of the most stressful jobs in the world and it has the highest suicide rate or something. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, And I'm, I had no idea that that's the job that I wanted to do. But anyway, um. So I went on to do electronic engineering. I studied that for two years at LYAT. And at, I, as I was doing that, I was in the family business as well. So I was um, working in the business as I was going through my leave insert and going through college. And then I was finishing in college in 2007, no, 1997. I think it was 1997, maybe 1998. Um, and the business had got into severe financial difficulty at that stage and my parents who had founded the business said will you come into the office and work and see if like do, do we need to close up and do we need to do this and again I suppose it was that are we here again do you know are we in this position is this like again there was there was more put into the business than should have been put into the business and there was things at stake um, and I could see by spending a month or two in the office and looking at our clients and looking at profit margins and looking at the amount of sales were coming and I was like we can totally survive this but it's going to mean we have to cut this part of the business out and dispose of it and that didn't go down well with my dad at all <laughs> because it was his he's a very high yellow so he's very, very entrepreneurial and he's the mad ideas. And, you know, he's like, he would have ideas coming out of his ears from the minute he gets up in the morning to he goes to bed at night. You couldn't possibly fulfill them all. Like, and I was kind of in that position where I was trying to protect their home and their livelihood and all of that. But I had to be bad cop and say, well, that idea that you've invested all this time and all this money in, is the bit that's causing the problem. So see the bit, the day-to-day -day stuff that's actually making money that you don't like doing. That's the stuff that we have to keep doing in order to get out of the shit show we're in. 
Um, and that took it took a toll on our family relationships too, because we were we were kind of in that space where it was our family unit now. Do you know it was not just the extended family? Yeah. It was me and my mom and my dad. You know, my brother at this stage was in the army and he was away overseas or whatever. So it didn't affect him too much. But um definitely it, it had a big impact on our ability to try and be civil to one another <laughs> for a while. Um, but in the end, you know, he he seen himself that it was going to go under if we didn't do something. Um, we were very close to that point anyway. Um, so the decision was taken to cut that side of the business out, dispose of it and pay it back the debt basically that had accrued. Um, so, yeah. I've been through a few of them rodeos, Pete. <laughs> so for you, I mean, that's that's quite something, I suppose, to come in and to take that strategic view, you know, that that early stage, really, I suppose, of your career, you know, that it's not just a case of come join the business. It's like, come join the business. Oh, and by the way, the building's on fire. Oh, you yeah. know, it, it's, it's two parts, right? Yeah. And I definitely don't know, like, I, I liked business at school. Like when I was doing my leaving and stuff, I loved business studies. I liked accountancy, um, but that's not what I was interested in doing. Like I had no desire to be in business or to do, I wanted to go and get a job and be paid and, you know, all that side of things. I mean, I know like the, the offer came across our desk actually when we were in um, electronic engineering college, uh, the company, I'm giving away my age here now, right? Um, so this company called compact mm -hmm. came and they were like you can come and finish college with us and we'll pay you 30 grand a year now you're going back many decades i was going 30 grand a year i was like my, my mom and dad don't earn that combined <laughs> do you know so i was like i was seriously tempted i was going to go and then they they took us in to this like big lecture hall and they they played us this brilliant promotional video that they had and this is where you'll be working and this is what you'll be creating and you'll be changing the world and everybody was like well let's go move to Dublin and go work for this crowd like and then they showed us what the where we would be working and it was in a clean room and obviously they're all suited and in all of this so I, I was kind of starting to get a little bit nervous then at that stage not because I'm claustrophobic but like you've met me I cannot be they couldn't sit me still for longer than an hour never mind Put me in there 40 hours a week so i i kind of was like i don't know if i could do that um i like being able like i that's one thing i did like about the business is that my job looked different every day mm. i was able to go to different types of work and i could go I'd be abseiling down a building cleaning windows one day and i'd be in a boat power washing or sandblast and another day and i'd be in some mansion of a house the day after you know polishing marble and I, that's one thing that I loved about the business was the variety that it gave. So I wasn't ever bored, put it that way. Um, and the, the thought of and working for somebody somewhere like Compaq where we would be in the same room, putting the same piece on the same component forever. I was like, I don't know if I could do that. Even at that early age, I think I had enough personal awareness excuse me, personal awareness to know, I don't think that's an it. Um, but yeah, so I can't remember what did, what did you ask me, Pete, that I rambled away off on that? No, we're just, I mean, it was just curious, you know, that sort of decision to you know, join the business, you know, the business. yeah. You know, I, th all... I definitely think my previous brush with businesses being in trouble helped me to stay help me make the decision to stay and help. Um, I think if, if I hadn't have experienced what I did when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have realized the impact that me not staying could have had. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Like I, I kind of, I knew that mom and dad's relationship, like any relationship, they have their dynamic, you know, and it has the person who does the decision making and the person who, cleans up after the decisions are made there was a dynamic there already and I had witnessed this my whole life and I knew that in the event that I didn't step in that dynamic would continue that paradigm would continue to play out 
and quite probably things wouldn't end well. And I didn't want that to happen to them again. I didn't want that to happen to mum in particular again. She'd already lost one home and I was afraid that if it happened again, she would leave him maybe, <laughs> you know, because, well, God only knows, like, you know. Um, but I suppose there was a part that I could play to try and make sure that that didn't happen. Was it my job to do it? No. Did I feel some sense of responsibility to try? Yeah. Am I still there trying? Yeah. <laughs> do you know, I, I suppose my intention never was to stay this long. Um, but I actually fell in love with being in business then as well. You know, it was only after you succeeded in doing that and you seen the numbers all starting to go up and you're like, oh, might actually be okay at the side business crack, <laughs> you know? Um, and seeing that you could make a difference, you know, you could help to build a business that created jobs and made an impact for other people outside of your family. That's that's a very rewarding part of being in business and what we do. And out of all the times when I felt like giving up, it's that part that stops me from giving up. It's the f knowing that if you stop, you stop creating jobs you stop helping people to achieve whatever it is that they're at work to achieve and people are not at work for no reason like you know they could sit at home and get paid if they really wanted to but they're out working to provide a better life for their family no different to my mom and dad did for me and for what I do for my family hmm. so it's recognizing that when when people take that step to go into employment and the work we do is not easy, you know, it's, it's hard work. It's not the best paid work. It's sometimes repetitive work. It's sometimes not recently now it's not thankless anymore, but up until prior to a couple of years ago, it was thankless work for a lot of people. Um, and knowing that you can help somebody to get their family holiday or, get their kid through college or whatever it is that they're that they're there to work to achieve that's important to me do you do you get as much out of the business as other people get out of the business emotionally and mentally of course i would say i i probably get more out of it um Again, not in the early years. In the early years, I probably was quite ungrateful for the opportunity that I had as a business owner. Um, but now I see it very differently. Now I see, like, ay, there's challenges and all that, but, like, what job or what business doesn't have challenges? Do you know? Um, it's look at the opportunity that you have in front of you to make an impact and to have an, a positive impact on people whether it's your clients or your staff or your own family like there's opportunity sitting in front of us every day if you choose to look at it that way in the years gone past I may have chose to look at it as a burden or you know that person rang in sick well you know you'd have been given out yards because that person didn't turn up for work and blah 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 and you wouldn't have taken into account maybe that person has a sick family member at home Maybe that person has shit going on that you as their employer know nothing about, you know, and it's through the master's program, through learning about learning, <laughs> learning to understand yourself and learning to understand what drives and motivates people and what drives and, and kind of what's the word I'm looking for. Um, how people and why people behave the way they do. You know, people don't not turn up to work because they're trying to ruin your day. That's that's how you feel. That's how I used to feel. But that's not the reason why. Do you know, you start making it about you. And you start looking at the world through the other side's lens. And you start to see things very differently. Um, but I would I would imagine. I probably get more emotionally out of the business than most. What, I mean, you talk about looking at things differently as opposed to, you know, 
they've not turned up and this is just just to annoy me almost you know it's like <laughs> no I mean what what's changed what's the difference and you how do you reflect or look at it now because as you say it's still that's business challenges right you know staffing yeah. clients things to get done things not getting done complaints customer services I mean it's it's endless right yeah so how, oh, how... It, it is and it's, it's challenging especially challenging when you're the person getting the phone call that something's gone wrong do you know so like you've you've already got 10 plates spinning and then somebody hands you another one and you're going what the fuck <laughs> you know but um I think what's changed for me is understanding that their their motivation is not about you their motivation for having to make that call to ring in sick or their motivation for wanting to leave the job and move on to something else or it's not about you you know and quite often it's our excuse the French it's our fucking ego gets in the way like we years ago I thought everything revolved around me everything revolved around when people rang and sick they didn't care about me you know when people rang in because their child was sick you couldn't ring in earlier do you know do you not realize the impact that's going to have on on our shifts now today and it's going to impact everything blah, blah, blah. you want like it's not about you when you realize when that penny finally drops that it's not about you it's about them and if you reframe Say somebody rings into me now. Now, yeah, yes, it can be challenging. Yes, the timing can be awful sometimes. But never make it about them. You know, if they ring, if they have to ring in to their work because they're whatever's gone wrong, they have enough shit going on without you laying more on top of it. Because all you're doing there is you're demotivating and devaluing an employee who may walk out the door when they do come back to work because you've treated them like shit. Do you know, um, and when I stopped behaving from a me perspective and started to look at the world through the other person's lens. Now, I'm not saying that I don't still look at it through my perspective. I do. And of course, you know, if somebody's ringing in all the time and they're, you know, they're not given. I don't feel it's all right to ask why somebody needs to call in. I, I've gone that far now. It's like. It's not my place. I know the, the needs of the business are that we need to have a certain amount of notice in order to get stuff covered. We very much develop a team mentality where everybody helps everybody else out. If somebody has a problem at home with their family or whatever's gone wrong, the team come in around them and they support them. And the same is expected in return. So if that person shows up for their team, their team will show up for them. But if they don't show up for their team, the team will call that out. They wouldn't help out. Pete rang in sick the last day and Annette wouldn't, she wouldn't stay on extra to help. That's a red flag. Mm. You're not a team player then because we all help each other because one of our values is family first. Family come first. Work does not come first. Your family do. So if it's a case that, you know, somebody calls in, I don't feel the need to question now what's up you know my first question is are you okay do you need anything that's the first question now years ago it would be like oh my god what are you doing <laughs> why are you ringing in this late do you know now the question's different it's a, ask a different question you know um but i think looking at it yes you have to look at through your own lens and through the lens of what the business needs but people don't do this, I suppose, stop, stop looking at it through your lens. That's what changed for me is to stop looking at it through the me lens and try and look at it through other people's perspective. And people do stuff in business sometimes. And I wonder what planning did you come off? Some of the stuff sometimes that happens or some of the stuff you hear about and you're going, oh my God, like why, why did you think that would be okay? But that's rare. That stuff is rare. Nine times out of 10, people struggle because they're having challenges in their personal life or with their kids or they have family members that are not well or, you know, could be any number of things. But when you ask the question, are you okay? And is there anything you need from us? You know, 
it's like they they just want to know that they're valued and supported and that their job is still there for them when they get this problem over with that they don't have their job to come back to as another problem i think we have to very much rethink our working ethos especially now um, mm. because people are literally leaving and resigning from jobs all sorts of jobs for all sorts of reasons but if we don't learn to communicate differently to our teams and to our employees we're screwed you know we really are um, because that's the last 20 months have shown people a different viewpoint on life and a different perspective on how they want to spend their time and what they value doing and who they value spending their time with and they're not going to spend their time with an asshole who questions their ability to look after their family or not do you know um i think, think it's it's hugely important that we we revisit that and look at it differently going forward do, do clients pick up on that do you think yes um I think one of the biggest questions that we have been asked over the last year is around our sustainability plans and our sustainability um, model within the business. I'm not just talking about the environmental stuff. I'm talking about, you know, everything from how we treat our staff, um, what kind of supports have we in place, how are we handling, you know, any mental health challenges that are coming up, like literally like from a, you're you're from an FM background yourself. So you know that the ethos and the culture within the FM sector up until recently has been very much of who can give me what I want for the lowest price. True? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is no longer the case. It's like, it, it's still the case to a degree, but it's certainly shifting. Like some of the questions and the contracts, some of the questions that have been asked on, contract bids and some of the interviews that I've done for contracts over the last six months has totally changed and been asked things like what are our um, staff engagement policies how do we promote staff wellness how are we um, incorporating circular economy into our business model you know some of like and this is stuff we're we're very proactive in this area anyway thankfully um, but I certainly, if you're not proactive in this area, you need to get your shit together <laughs> because you're not going to win business without taking into account that the old rules of business, they don't apply anymore. And that's, that's the bit that I love. That's the bit I'm passionate about is how do we make the old rules of business obsolete? How do we change it? Be, the, be that red line of innovation that changes an entire sector. You know, because it's something that I feel very strongly about that our people in our sector are the most phenomenal people you'll ever meet. They really are like they do a hard job for low wages, very little zero to little respect. And they do it at the most god awful times of the day and night. And they do it without question. They're so loyal. They love their buildings. They love their people in their buildings. They take such good care of what they do. They take such pride in what they do. And I think if every industry had people like our industry have, we would be in a much stronger position in a lot of sectors. Um, and I think they're massively undervalued for what they deliver. And I personally want to be that red line, the pain in the ass of the industry trying to make change. It's my mission. It's beautiful. I mean, it's, as you say, I mean, there's a reason they call it a service industry. And, mm -hmm. and it's in, in that context, people, as you say, I don't know that they fully appreciate the value. And yet, if you ask people about their core values, or their soul values, and it's generally, you know, love or service, you know, be of service to others and all the rest, service is included at that level as well. So, you know, it is to mm -hmm. people love their buildings, people love the staff, people go over and above because they can. Yeah. And they, they do, like, they do it, albeit some of them might give out, right? Yeah, we all do it. Yeah, come right. 
a flick and seal of this place again and they're giving out their gift. They wouldn't change it. Like they love what they do. And they they exude so much um loyalty for the clients that we serve, you know. Um and I, I see every day of the week it's something that we come across where there'll be you you'll have you'll know this term yourself, contract creep. So there'll be things that are done extra. And all of a sudden you'll go, why, why are you lifting cups from all the desks? That's not in our contract. It's like, oh, she can't leave them. Jesus, there'd be stuff growing out of them if you left them. They'd leave them there all week, you know, <laughs> and they're making life hard for themselves. But it's because they don't they don't want that poor girl there to drink out of a cup that has blue mold on it because she might get food poisoning. Sure, she could be pregnant or anything. Like, you know, some of the stuff that you hear back and you're going, they they go above and beyond all the time you know um one of the best examples and i think i've shared this with you before like one of the best examples i love going studying and i use this term very loosely i go to florida to study <laughs> as disney um when you look at that campus in orlando and you look at the the amount of um ground that has to be covered and the the hundreds of thousands of guests every day and how they keep that place so immaculately clean all the time literally you could go in there morning and night fireworks parades doesn't matter what's going on it is spotless all the time and I am absolutely just so inspired by how do they do it how I love so I sit there for hours just when we eat um Starbucks cup on the sidewalk, just watching them going up and down and up and down. And my family are going, can we go and do rides now? And I'll be going, go ahead. I'll be over in a wee while. I'm just fascinated by watching how they actually deliver that level of service all the time. And it's it's about creating something more than just it's it's for them, it's not just about creating um uh a clean environment it's more than that for them they've it's built the experience. service and happiness and all of that like the ability to make guests smile they've built that into the culture of every single part of the business even the people sweeping the streets you know are they're like making wee mickey heads on the ground with their with their wee brushes and all and you're going and you see all these kids around go, you know, and it's just, it's just so amazing how they do it. Um, it's, it's possible for our industry to be more than what it is. And I think the last 20 months have shifted people's perception of what we do quite a, quite a bit. And it has definitely helped sh shine a light on the work that we do in our sector. Um, but I think it's far from, changed anything you know i think there's going to have to be um leadership shown in our sector to make these changes happen um but hey hands up i'm happy to try <laughs> take me back about this whole disney thing okay. where did it start how on earth well i went on honeymoon to Disney in 2004. Me and Gareth got married in 2004. So when's that? 20? No, 17. Is that right? 17 years ago? Mm -hmm. 18, yep. 18 years ago coming. Anyway, cut a very long story short. We went to Florida because our friends used to go to Florida and they were always raving away about Orlando and it was the best place ever and stuff. And we were like, well, we try there and go there and honeymoon for the crack. So they seem to rave about it all the time. So we went for three weeks and we did 20 days straight, didn't take a day off, and we didn't get round everything. And I was sitting on the wee seat outside our hotel, ready to come home from honeymoon, wailing like a child, crying my eyes. I didn't want to leave. And Gareth's like, are you all right? Like, seriously? <laughs> I was going, I don't want to go home. I love it here. And I, I don't know what it was about there I'd never been before I'd never been to theme parks before I'd been in, I'd been to like um I'd been on holidays before with my friends and stuff um I'd been on holidays with Gareth before 
when I was very young, I had been to America with my family over. We have family over in the States too. So I had been there on holidays when I was a kid. Um, and we went to um, like Great Adventure with Six Flags now, mm-hmm. but I was too small to get on anything. So I don't really remember it that well. I remember pizza the size of the table. I remember these huge big pizzas that would come out and they were bigger than me nearly. But I wasn't actually tall enough to go on any of the rides. So I, I, I definitely didn't have an experience of like roller coasters and all that adrenaline stuff when I was a kid. Um, but I, yeah, when I went on honeymoon, something inside me flipped and I became a Disney nut. Now, not all things Disney, just theme parks. Don't really care for all the other stuff. I, like, I don't sit watching Disney films all the time. I am obsessed with their theme parks. And I think maybe as a business owner, I kind of, I went there and I was in complete awe of how the hell do they keep this so clean? You're talking about a quarter of a million people a day go through the place. And I'm going, like if a quarter of a million people walk through Ireland, there would be litter falling into the sea because we couldn't, we couldn't manage it. So I was maybe a bit awe in awe of how did they do this and how did they run such an amazing, like, facility to create this experience the only way I can describe it it's like walking in to a bubble and all of the problems of the world just sit outside the bubble and you just enjoy your day and have the crack and when you come back out again and you go back to your hotel you can back out of your bubble again and you can pick up your problems again then and you leave them there when you go back the next day um it's just out of all the things that motivate and drive me Um, And I know I've shared this with you previously. That's the only thing really. Me and Gareth joke all the time. I was like, it forever ruined every other holiday I've ever experienced has always been compared to Disney. And it's like, Disney's away up here and other holidays are like here. No matter how good they are, they're not Disney good. I know. Is it the, I think you've said, I mean, it's just, is it the, is that it's that level of service? I mean, it's service of the absolute pinnacle. I mean, I assume it's the pinnacle. Is that your is that your view? Is they are if, if ever there was a gold gold standard, that's it. I know there is there is definitely a, a change with Disney in the last number of years. Um, now in the last few years, I've the last time I was there was two thousand and nineteen, so I. I have not experienced what some other people see. So if you're if you're like me and you're in all the Disney groups that are online, um, you'll see people giving out about, oh, the Disney magic is lost and this. I haven't experienced that. When I, the last time I was there and the times, I try and go as often as I can um, every year if that's achievable. Um, that's not what my experience has been. My experience is you see people that, go out of their way to create a magical experience for somebody else. That's, that's not even service. That's somebody's gone out of their way to make a child or a family member or somebody have a way better than expected experience. You know, it's not, here's the bar and this is what we must achieve within budget. You know, that's not the the remit that they have. The remit that they have is if you have the opportunity to create joy and magic for somebody that's paying to be in our park, take it. Do it. Don't wait for permission. You know, and that's, it's like, yeah, you pay through the nose to be there and you pay through the nose for everything you buy in the park, but built into that, there's the flexibility for them to create this joy that... Hmm. I've, I've never experienced it anywhere else. Um, the one thing that I, I can't miss, and it's like, there's a, how would you put it? There's a non-negotiable on our trips, right? That the, the fireworks at the Magic Kingdom, they are a must several times during the holiday. But on the last night before we come home, there I don't care if we have to queue from five o'clock in the evening, <laughs> we're watching them at a, there's places in front of the castle where the fireworks are just I don't know if you've ever been but they're amazing anywhere in the park but there's parts in front of the castle where you have an 
unobstructed view, but you have to queue to get those standing spots where you're not, somebody's head's not in front of you. And when you're my height, you have to queue early, right? So on the last, <laughs> on the last day before we go home, that's kind of my non-negotiable. It's like, go and do whatever you want. But from if the fireworks are at six o'clock or nine o'clock at night from six, I'm going to be waiting in my spot because that's the last opportunity I'm going to get to see them to the next time I come back. So it's like, that's my, that's my thing. But they literally, I, if you've, if you've seen them, you'll know what I'm going to say when I say this, but the emotion that comes out, even just talking about them now, yeah, um, it's absolutely unbelievable. Like there's literally 150,000 people standing watching this castle going all these mad colors and shapes and fireworks and everybody's crying. Everybody's going, wow. And they're all crying, ball and crying with happiness. And it's like, this is just the most, it, it is magical. Hmm. It's beautiful. I'm kind of, yeah, I'm my head again. kind of wondering <laughs> to what extent would you push your six-year-old into the water to get to the front? <laughs> yes, she would be, <laughs> be using her as a, as a, like, standing there now, make sure nobody stands in, because it's for, for them too. Like, I know when we took her when she was really young, like, she used to be crying when the firework, no, the bangs of the firework, mm -hmm. she would get a little bit scared and stuff. So the second time we went over, my husband bought her, like, earmuffs, you know, those, like, peloton jobs mm -hmm. that... <laughs> She's wee pink earmuffs, but no, she's she's fine now. But when she was a little tiny kid, like when she was a wee baby, she was like, "Oh, what's that noise?" But um, <laughs> like, yeah. mommy doesn't care. Mommy doesn't... <laughs> Shh, be quiet. <laughs> You're upsetting me. Keep going. Yeah. You're ruining my magic. Be quiet. Um, no, it's so, but I... it's so important to have that, though, isn't it? I mean, despite as you say, I mean all the all the things you've been through and, and maintaining the business and being creative and all the rest, it's, it's, it's beautiful at the same time then that there's certain things that are non-negotiable, right? So it's an investment in you in terms of time or away time or, you know, your emotional health and, and well-being. really. It's, I mean, is that something you've consciously done or it's just come naturally for you? A hundred percent consciously done. Um, to the point where I'll give you an example. So like, when when times were really hard and times were tough um it was the one thing like we had to give up so many other things and like for years during the very very tough times of like 2010 on i i was um my last trip was 2010 and i didn't get away again then for five years and i know that seems like oh god that's not why long but when you don't have anything else like there was, there was nothing else that I wanted to do. There was nowhere else I wanted to go. I only wanted to get back to there. And that was for a lot of my personal motivation was to try and save every penny I could just to get back to that place. Because I mentioned this before, it's like when you, for, for anybody that's ever been and anybody that likes to go, there's a place on the way into the magic kingdom where you can come there you come under the arch and you go around and you can see the castle so that round in that corner and then being able to come on to main street and see the castle it's like the entire i don't know what it is there's this feeling it's like the sun's on your back you don't get it any other park it's only florida because it's always sunny so it's like you come in and the sun's beaming down and you start to smell all the smells, you know, the popcorn and the bakery and the hot dog people. And you start to get that visual of all the balloons on the way down Main Street and stuff. And then you see the castle and the amount of people that get emotional at that point and they're only getting into the park. You know, it's like the and I don't think you get that the very first time you go. It's only after you've experienced it and you leave. And then you come back. That's when people cry at the fireworks, maybe their first time. But it's when the park actually and that experience has an impact on you. It's coming back to that experience that makes you emotional coming back into the park. So like the very first day of my holiday and I'm going into magic. I'm like, oh my God. 
Yeah, no, I'm so sad. Um, and then I'm all right. Like once you get past that, we bet you're grand again then. But it's like, for me, it's it's almost like this is what I work for. This is what drives me to get through the days that are tough or get navigate the challenges that have been there for the last year or whatever it is. That's the that's the reward. And when you know when you work towards your reward all the time and you finally achieve it, it is emotional. You know, for some people, it might be, you know, to get a new car or to buy a property or, you know, whatever their thing is. That's what my that's what the thing is for me. Do you think it's does it make you a better business owner or entrepreneur? Um, never thought about it like that. I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm definitely more mindful of knowing why I'm doing stuff. Mm. You know, I, I for years I didn't like right up until 2012, 13, I never looked at goals or set goals. I just kind of fire fought my way through things and <laughs> tried to survive, you know. And then when you realized, well, you can actually engineer some stuff here. You can like like that before I was trying to maybe avoid the bad stuff. I was trying to avoid the pain, but I wasn't consciously trying to create situations that brought, brought me joy and made me feel fulfilled and made me feel accomplished and all of that. Whereas now I sit down, well, the board is done now for 2022, but you'll quadrant out or you'll, you'll line out my whiteboard and I'll, there's a travel box in there and I'll, I wish this situation would just jog on so we can get back to traveling properly again. But there's a, there's a list of things that I, list of places I want to go. And I will look at things like education or business development and I'll try and marry up, you know, is there a course I want to do? Well, where's the, co where's the course available? Where can I do the course? So don't just book the course in Dublin because it's available in Dublin. If the course is available in LA and LA is on my list of travel and oh, lo and behold, look, there's a Disney in LA too. So I can do the course and do Disney at the same time, then I'm going to book Disney and do the course. Do you know? I was wondering, because I mean, as we were talking earlier about being pain or pleasure focused, you know, and sometimes it is a case of we're driven because we can do, as you say, to, to rescuing your business, to, you know, working through the pain and doing all that and because you can. And then there's there, there is always that flip side of going because I want to, because I get to, mm -hmm. because I'd love to. Because I you get know. to. Yeah. And that, that's huge. I... I definitely have, and I, I think it's because the business is in a better space that I can get to, hmm. you know, there was definitely a period of time where get to didn't come into the equation. I need to was the driving force. Um, but now I, I'm much more aware, I suppose my, my thinking has shifted, my beliefs have changed, my understanding of what I can create and what I'm capable of is different to what it was back then. Um, my experience of what I've been able to achieve in the past is there as well. Um, and now I look at things differently and I, I consciously try and carve out, you know, like I, I have family in London and I like going to see them, but I can't just get on a plane and go for no reason i have to like try and work it into well how what's on what's what's on when in london this year and i'll be like well there's the cleaning shows on there or the pest shows on there or the fm shows on there and i'll ring my family and go are you around this weekend this weekend this weekend grant well we'll book flights for them then and then and i'll stay in a hotel this weekend but then i'll stay with you for that one and then we'll go and we'll do that show and we'll you know and you try and I've I've got better at trying to weave the different parts of my life together to be able to achieve more, if that makes sense. Um, if you have to go to travel, why not take three or four things off on the one trip rather than 
just go to do that and not visit family or not do something for work when you're there. You know, I know I used to get slagged a lot whenever we would do the, the couple of girls holidays that we've been on. And I would take out my laptop after dinner and start answering emails and blah, blah, blah. And they'd be like, oh my God, like you're on holidays. Stop. And I'm going, no, I get to solve these problems now instead of going home and having the anxiety of 5,000 emails when I go home from holidays. I don't have any anxiety because I've dealt with it all when I'm here. And sure, only having dinner and sitting having the crack, I'm still listening to you. I'm still talking. Do you know, I just, I, I don't know. I've kind of, I've developed a better work-life balance over the last decade. Do you know, it's, it's still not maybe as healthy as I would like it to be sometimes. Sometimes I do overwork or I work too long. Um, but then does it really work if you love what you do? Like, you know? That's true. Yeah, it's, but it is, it's getting that mix, isn't it? Yeah. What are you capable of? Mm, don't know why I ask myself this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sometimes you kind of feel, I had a bit of that actually this weekend. I'm kind of going, I'm not where I, I want it to be, you know, and we're looking now into the end of the year already. And I'm going, I'm not exactly where I thought I would be at this point in the year. Um, has there been challenges that I didn't anticipate? Yes. Have they had an impact? Yes. Could it be hard on myself? It could be, but I'm not going to be because life is what it is and family are important and they're they're one of the reasons that maybe things didn't just flow as smooth as smoothly as what I would have anticipated this year um but I I believe that I'm capable of more than what I currently achieve um have no idea how I'm going to achieve it and um, but I I want to believe that I am capable of creating really, really positive change for not just our sector, but for all services sector. Um, I think there's a, I think there's a, because of what's happened over the last 20 months, I think there's a huge introspection happening within the workforce of all, all industries. But I think one industry or some industries that are going to suffer more than others are the ones that didn't have the option to work from home. Mm. Um, and I think those industries are really going to struggle to get staff um, and to maintain staff and to retain talent in the years ahead. And if we're going to solve the problem of our workforce, we need to rethink how we do things we need to, we need to reset and go back to the drawing board and look at how do we create value to attract people into these sectors and how do we motivate them to work well and keep them here and you know there are some phenomenal people within our sector already and i and i hope that they they stay there but we're going to have a fight to keep them mm. you know there's so many other sectors out there that are better paid they're classed as easier work people get to work from home they get to you know stick their washing on <laughs> get the dinner on while they're on their tea break you know there's so many advantages to to working from home and like we've started to see it within the commercial space sector where big big companies are issuing work from home permanently as an option for staff and they're closing down big buildings um i don't think that maybe will be a, a big problem within the first five years mm -hmm. but if this continues you know for a substantial amount of time why would they rent and pay facilities management companies to operate and keep these massive costs and overhead buildings opened if everybody's working from home and productivity is higher than what it had been previously yeah so but then, a bit like with Disney, you can talk about it, you can look at it, you can do everything, but until you're nothing physically there, going. it's a bit like the workplace, you know, it's just there's nothing beats face-to-face -to -face and nothing beats being in the experience of being with, you know, it's, it's always been a, 
you know, since have- the internet came in, people were saying the offices are gone and it's actually more important than ever, really, quality. Yeah, I think definitely there's, until they figure out the collaboration piece and how they figure out how do you get the best innovation and how do you get the best collaboration out of people and how do you get a team to the jail without them being in person um, until they figure that bit out. But they'll they'll figure it out at some point. Mm-hmm. The magic. <laughs> dare, dare I ask what your guilty pleasure is? It's probably a foregone conclusion. What do you need to ask? <laughs> um, actually, right. There, there's a... Uh, there's a Starbucks on the entrance to most parks. And then they've also this fantastically magical, massive cookie with all sorts of crap on it. <laughs> that's my guilty pleasure. Yeah, uh, that's the go-to. That is yeah. the go-to. And leisure and pleasure, what does that look like for you then? Um, I suppose downtime. Mm. is leisure for me so like my weekends kind of um my weekends look a wee bit different at the minute because of circumstances at home both my parents aren't very well so um that looks a little bit different at the minute um but definitely like just till night getting a, getting to lie on past nine o'clock is just like our alarm on yesterday didn't nobody there was no alarms and nobody in the house woke until like five to nine and I was going I'm in the twilight zone. What happened? It was the best sleep I'd had in so long. Um, so the spending time at the home at the weekends, reading a good book or four. Um, and then the other thing really is like for pleasure, it's learning. I know that sounds really like, I don't know, boring, dorky. I don't know. Um, I love learning, love, love, love. If I'm not doing four courses, I'm not well. Um, so there's always courses or books or you know something on the go that I'm trying to get my head around. Um, so yeah, and that's again when it comes to goals and stuff. There's always like an education bucket on the board, and I have a list of I want to do that course or I want to learn about that that skill set or I'm really poor in this area and I want to develop you know how about financial and um accountancy and that side of it maybe you know so there's always something there that I'm kind of going could we could just be we could improve that I could improve that so (laughs) so if Disney open a university you're gone they have one yeah, not on not on their university list just yet. I need to, you know, maybe like sell a kidney or something to be able to afford that. But that can be um, arranged. I definitely like my. I know I have uh, my husband laughs at me. I have a bucket list of the when we're old. Now, like define old. So I I could call myself old any day and get away with going. Um, but I still have responsibilities to a, an under 18 here that I have I have to get her up and away and on her path. But uh, I would love to retire over there and go and work over there. Be quite happy mm. to just that would be my retirement plan. Just have a house here to come back and stay with the daughter and visit and stuff. But I'd be quite happy to park my ass in Florida and wave hi to people coming into the park have a nice day <laughs> you might need to stay away from the starbucks though every day <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my daughter and me joke all the time it's like i'm gonna i keep telling her i'm gonna be tinkerbell and the fireworks at the end of the fireworks show tinkerbell jumps out of the castle and she like zip lines down mm-hmm. to the other side of the park i'm gonna i'm gonna do that when i retire i'm gonna be tinkerbell awesome <laughs> What's, what is your favorite character, by the way? Do you have a favorite character? Not really, no. Mm. No, I don't really have one. I, I like I like them all. Kind of, most of them. Some of them I don't know. Some of them are walking around and I'm kind of going, who are, who are they? That's what I'm saying. I'm not mad into Disney mm. TV and stuff. It's simply the, the, the park. And they've created this, they've created this really amazing space where families can go. And no matter whether they're three or they're, 103 
they can do something all day that they can have fun and they can do it together if they want or they can go off on their own wee paths and they're still all in the one bubble it's mm-hmm. pretty cool what's some of the best advice you ever had Ooh. actually there was a guy on we were on a mastermind years and years and years ago and he used to have the saying and at the beginning it was really annoying but then it kind of started to ring through a lot he had the phrase who made that room and when you would <laughs> when you would say you know they would say why don't you do this and well that wouldn't work because or you know we can't do that our sector doesn't work that way and and he would always go who made that room so you'd always question your reasoning or your beliefs around um he would always question your thinking um and at, like I say at the beginning I was like, why does he keep saying that but eventually the penny dropped that he was trying to get you to think differently mm-hmm. he was trying to make you think about things in a different frame um or a different perspective um so he was one and then the other one I suppose would be Danielle and Natalie um the boss babes so they have um, a saying or a slogan within their business about being unapologetically ambitious and about making an income while you're making an impact um, they're the kind of the two things that they um, I suppose they promote such as like don't apologize for being ambitious um, and that's something that probably during the years I was called a workaholic you're called you know greedy you're called all these things because you worked 100 hours a week it's like do you really need to be working that much and it's like well part of it was necessity through certain times in that journey I had not have any choice and the other side of it is I love what I do so it doesn't feel like work when you love what you do um and then this is something that we're actively working towards on all three businesses at the minute is around having um, an impact for the work that we do. So having an impact on our clients, having an impact for our staff and having an impact for the wider community um, and looking at strategic, um, I suppose strategic charity partners or um, people that will benefit from the work that we do. So that's something that we're actively working on trying to nail down for each of the, the business units so that we can make an impact, make a better impact than what we're just doing. It's not just about what profit we make. If we can facilitate helping other people through our growth, then why wouldn't we? You know? And we both, that's it. Yeah. You know, if you were trying to summarize your fire in the belly in one or two words, what would they be? Mm. learning would be one I think that's that's one of my biggest motivators um drivers um family family is huge for me for for many different reasons but I'm sure it's the same for everybody mostly most people um Hmm. and then I suppose I have this this is really corny right but I have this tattoo and this is that's kind of when you're looking at it this way it's upside down that one means it's upside down right that means life that one means strength and that one means north and they it was a saying that a friend of mine had many years ago and it was like just live your life you know, stop apologizing for living it. Be happy. Do what you want. Um, don't hurt other people. Don't go like hell for leather and don't think of the consequences on other people. But don't apologize for wanting what you want. Um, strength is my side of things, I suppose. That, that was something that came from m- me and knowing that you can survive everything that's put in front of you. If you're still here and you're still breathing, you have survived everything that's put in front of you. So you will survive another day. No matter how bad it is or how shit things get, 
if you don't give up. You know, it's not failure unless you stop and you quit. It's a lesson to be learned. It's something that still has to be navigated. It's a challenge that you haven't managed to surpass yet, but it's not over until you quit. And then the last one is North. And the North came from the friend again, um, but it was more about, do you actually know you're going? Have you thought about, are you just plowing on through life? You know, is it a case that you're just going whatever way life decides you're going today? Do you just go with the flow or do you actually know where you want to go? And that, for me, that last one is personally, it's experience. It's things like Disney or taking Cassie to Lake Garda or taking her to the cleaning show in London so that I can go and see my Uncle Billy, <laughs> you know? So that's what she sees, do you know? Um, it's like, but I want business and mommy being in business to be a positive experience for her because mm. it wasn't a positive experience for me. And I want her to see a very different perspective. And if she chooses to go and be in business, great. If she chooses to go and get a job somewhere, that's whatever, it's, that's her life. But I want to try and show her a different perspective to the one that I grew up with. Um, but yeah, so that that's kind of my wee motto on mm. life. And I look at that all the time and I'm like, am I living that? Am I, am I actually living that? Do I know where I'm going? Some days I wonder. Um, but most days, most days I do, I think. Yeah. Follow your north. Follow your, Yeah. There's a brilliant book, actually. I think it's Mar. I must read it out. Um, I think it's Martha Beck, Your North Star, Find Your North Star. It's an okay. excellent book. Mm. Um, Always love a good. What is what is good standout books for you then? I mean, Martha Beck, obviously North Star. Oh, um, what do we see? Let me have a look over here. Uh, Atomic Habits, High Performance Habits. Obviously, Think and Grow Rich is in there. Um, growth or Mindset for Carol Dweck is another good book. Um, wow, oh, there's so many. You could go on for days. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's that little so cheeky smile books. coming out. Like, oh, oh just, my God. Just you want to see this over here? It's like there's just books everywhere. I Oh, there's a few. There's actually, if you're in the service sector, there's a few books written by the disney company that are phenomenal reads actually the magic within is one and then the disney way is another one it's like their ethos around customer service and all of that sort of stuff so it's it's more around the business side of disney and how they operate their business um anything by bob Iger. just if you're on masterclass his masterclass series is excellent um yeah bring back bob <laughs> mm. somehow somehow i uh, know but... i know well, listen, well, how can... actually... sorry go ahead because say, how can people track you down hunt you down follow you if any of the through the websites of the companies or yeah any well if you go on fm services group.ie um you'll find the links to all the other companies on there um me you'll get me on instagram or facebook at annette houston just um I'm prehistoric, so I've been. I was able to get my own name on both, <laughs> on both platforms when they opened all them years ago. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm pretty easy to find. Final message you'd like to leave with the listeners? Um, just never stop learning. Never stop being inquisitive, and if you do run into challenges, don't forget to ask for help, or don't like bury your head and pretend that you're the only person that can solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it it all boils down to, for me in a way, it all boils down to knowing, knowing that you're capable with the support of others, you're capable of pretty much anything you decide to to try and achieve. Um, May take you a few goals may take a few years but you get there yeah. as long as you don't quit this is a big one this, and that and uh, that is probably my biggest 
maybe not always dependent on the perspective. It may not always be my best attribute, but the resilience that is required to not give up sometimes. Um, if you can learn to develop that muscle, I think it's hard to develop that muscle until you're in challenging circumstances that force you to develop the muscle. Um, so I don't wish that on anybody, but just don't quit. Don't quit. And that has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you for taking us through and listening to so many insights in there. So I've no doubt we will speak again. So thank you so time. much and have a lovely holiday, Christmas. Certainly will. Thank you. Take care. Bye.